In this lecture, we're going to explore the relationship between the characteristic function and weak convergence. If mu n is a sequence of probability measures on the real line converging weakly to a measure mu, then, in fact, the Fourier transform of mu n converges pointwise to the Fourier transform of mu. The reason is that the Fourier transform is defined to be the integral of the measure against a continuous bounded test function, e xc. And therefore, by the very definition of weak convergence, we get this pointwise convergence. Now, recall the portmanteau theorem, which gave us a whole host of other equivalent conditions to this weak convergence. We're about to add one more to the list, because this implication that weak convergence implies pointwise convergence of characteristic functions is true in the converse as well. In fact, an even stronger statement is true, and here is what is known as the continuity theorem that we're going to prove in this lecture. If mu n is a sequence of Borel probability measures on Rd, suppose that the Fourier transforms mu n have a pointwise limit function, phi, and suppose that that pointwise limit function is continuous at zero, then it turns out that that phi is the characteristic function of a unique Borel probability measure on the real line, mu, and in that case, the original sequence of measures converges weakly to that mu. Thus, we don't even need to know that mu n hat converges to mu hat for a predetermined measure. We only need to know that mu n hat converges at all, and if the limit function happens to be continuous at just one point, then it actually is continuous everywhere, is the characteristic function of a unique measure, and that measure is the weak limit of the sequence of measures mu n. For example, we saw that if x is a Rademacher random variable, and we take independent copies of x, add them up, and standardize, dividing by the square root of n, then the characteristic function of that standardized sum converges pointwise to this function here. We also computed explicitly that that function is the characteristic function of the standard normal distribution, but even if we didn't know that a priori, this function is of course continuous at zero, and therefore by the continuity theorem, it follows from here that this standardized sum does converge weakly to something. That something is of course the unique probability measure whose characteristic function is this, and we know that that is the standard normal distribution. We're going to need several auxiliary results in order to prove this theorem. So let's proceed. The first is a lemma, which is a version of what's sometimes called Parseval's theorem, a duality relation for Fourier transforms of measures under integration. If mu and nu are two probability measures, their Fourier transforms are bounded functions and therefore integrable with respect to any probability measure. We can integrate the Fourier transform of one measure against the other measure, and it doesn't matter what order we do that in. We can exchange them. Proving this is a simple application of Fubini's theorem. If we write down the definition of the Fourier transform of, say, the measure mu, we can then exchange the order of integration here since the function of two variables here is bounded and therefore integrable with respect to either of the two variables and, of course, measurable in both. And so by Fubini, we can exchange the order of integration and notice that this inside integral is the definition of the Fourier transform of nu at the point x. And thus, we have recovered this side. This proof is the reason why I elected to write the integration variable as x on one side versus c. Of course, it doesn't matter what I call it. The result holds true. Now, a corollary of this which we'll use is if I simply take real parts of both sides and move the real part inside, and then subtract from one both of those two sides using the fact that the integral of one against either probability measure is one, I get this property right here, which we're now going to use to give a uniform tail estimate on a probability measure determined by this function of its characteristic function. We'll state it quite generally here. If rho is any probability density on Rd that is supported in the unit ball, well, for starters, we know that since it is a probability density, its Fourier transform decays to zero at infinity. That's the Riemann-Lebesgue lemma. And therefore, there is some m determined by rho, so that outside the ball of radius m, that density's 
characteristic function is less than or equal to a half in modulus, for example. So using that m for any such row that we want to choose, if I take any probability measure on rd, then the tail of that probability measure, the measure of the set outside the ball of radius a, can be bounded like this. It's less than or equal to this function, 1 minus the real part of the characteristic function of mu at this m over a times x integrated over the unit ball times the density rho. The efficacy of this estimate is that it is universal over mu. That is, the input is mu hat, but the constants involved don't depend on mu at all. We're always integrating over the unit ball, and we can use any density we want here to get the result for all mu's. For example, one explicit way this is often stated in the one-dimensional case is to apply this theorem in the case where rho is the uniform probability measure on the symmetric unit interval. As we've calculated before, in that case, the Fourier transform of rho is the sinc function, and therefore the Fourier transform is less than or equal to 1 over the modulus of C, since sine is less than or equal to 1. If we want that to be less than or equal to 1 half, it's good enough to assume that C is greater than or equal to 2, so we can set m equal to 2 in this example. And so applying this in that setting, we will get the following. The probability that the random variable x is greater than or equal to a is less than or equal to the integral of this function, 1 minus the real part of its characteristic function at 2 over a times x integrated over the symmetric unit interval. Often that is stated after this change of variables sending 2 over a times x to you. Notice that phi x has modulus less than or equal to 1 and therefore the real part is less than or equal to 1, so the integrand inside here is non-negative. It's also less than or equal to 2, and so in principle this might have no content. We could get a number bigger than 1 here, but in fact, in most interesting cases, as you can work out, you get an integral here that is quite small. For example, you can work out easily using the duality between smoothness of a function and decay properties of its Fourier transform that if phi is C1, meaning that the probability measure has a finite first moment, you will always get an estimate here that is like 1 over a, which we would get more simply from Markov's inequality. To prove this, we're going to use the Parseval duality relation from the first lemma. Let's fix an epsilon greater than 0 and consider the probability measure nu, which has probability density rho, but rescaled to live on the ball of radius epsilon rather than the ball of radius 1. Then the Fourier transform of that probability measure just written out from the definition here, can be computed using the change of variables y is equal to x over epsilon to equal this integral, which is the definition of rho hat of epsilon times c. Now, using that and the Parseval duality relation, we can write this quantity as follows, which leads to the quantity that we want to appear as the upper bound for the tail estimate in question. Indeed, writing the definition of nu in terms of the density rho and changing variables x is equal to c over epsilon, we have this as the quantity involved. On the other hand, rho hat is modulus less than or equal to 1, therefore its real part is less than or equal to 1, and so this quantity is non-negative. We can therefore bound this integral by multiplying by an indicator function inside, that is, the indicator of the exterior of the ball of radius m over epsilon. We choose it that way because outside that ball, rho hat of the variable is, by design, less than or equal to 1 half, and therefore 1 minus it is greater than or equal to 1 half, which means that this quantity, after integration, is greater than or equal to 1 half times the integral of this, which is, of course, the measure of the set we're interested in. But that's the same as the set where the modulus of c is greater than or equal to m over epsilon. Epsilon was an arbitrary positive constant there, and so if we define this to be a, that makes 
epsilon over x equal to m over a times x. And we can also reduce this integral over rd to the integral over the unit ball because we're integrating against this density which is supported on the unit ball. And that proves the tail estimate that we were interested in. Now the use of this tail estimate is not concretely to bound the tails of probability measures. As I indicated, it usually is less instructive than something simple like Markov's inequality or Chebyshev's inequality for those purposes. The use of it is in its robust uniformity over all probability measures. And here is the reason that that's important to us. Using this tail estimate, we can show that if mu n is any sequence of probability measures on Rd, for which the Fourier transforms have a pointwise limit that is continuous at zero, it follows that that sequence is a tight sequence of probability measures. Remember that tightness means that uniformly over the whole sequence, for any epsilon, one can find a compact set k epsilon, so that the measure with respect to any mu n of the complement of that compact set is less than epsilon. To prove that, we'll use a probability density rho on the unit ball and the constant m outside which its Fourier transform is less than one half from the lemma, and therefore from our tail estimate, we get that the measure mu n of the exterior of a ball of radius a is bounded by this quantity here. Now by assumption, mu n hat converges pointwise to phi, and this quantity inside here is always bounded between zero and two. This is a probability density, and therefore by the dominated convergence theorem, as n goes to infinity, this integral converges to that tail estimate with the function phi involved. Now again, by the boundedness there, if we take delta of a to be the supremum over the ball of radius one of the modulus of that inside quantity, then this integral is less than or equal to two times delta of a. Now we don't know that much about delta of a as a varies, except that as a goes to infinity, m over a times x goes to zero, and our assumption is that phi is continuous at zero, and therefore this quantity must go to zero as a goes to infinity. Now, what does that tell us about mu n of this set? Well, if I fix any epsilon greater than zero, I can therefore choose a large enough so that this function delta of a is less than epsilon over four. Now, once I've chosen that a, noting that as we showed, this converges to this, I can make the difference between these two less than epsilon over two for all large n. In other words, I can choose n such that for little n bigger than or equal to capital N, that inequality holds true. But that means that mu n of the complement of the ball of radius a will be by what we've written here, less than or equal to two delta of a plus the discrepancy here, which is at worst epsilon over two. And by our construction, that's going to be less than epsilon. So what that means is that for any epsilon, I can choose an a and an n such that past n the ball of radius a does the trick for tightness. But of course, for those first n, I can choose a radius for each one of them, it will work. And then the maximum of all those radii with a will give us the ball that yields tightness. We've now done all the work that we need to do. We've proved that under the assumptions that we need, our sequence is a tight sequence, which means that we are set up to use Prochorov's compactness theorem. And so now let us conclude with the proof of the continuity theorem. We assume that mu n is a sequence of probability measures whose Fourier transforms converge pointwise to a function which is continuous at zero. Using the tail estimate as we just did, we therefore conclude that that sequence mu n is tight, and hence by Prokhorov's compactness theorem, there exists a subsequence of the measures mu n k that converge weakly to some probability measure on Rd. But as we noted, 
weak convergence implies pointwise convergence of characteristic functions. So mu n k hat of xi converges to mu hat of xi for all xi. On the other hand, by assumption, mu n k hat, which is a subsequence of mu n hat, converges pointwise to the function phi for all xi. And of course, by uniqueness of limits of complex valued functions, we conclude that mu hat is equal to phi. In other words, the function phi, which is the limit, is actually the characteristic function of some probability measure, and we know that we can recover the measure from the characteristic function, so there's a unique probability measure here. So to complete our claim, we need to show that mu n, the original sequence, converges to that mu, not just a subsequence of it. Well, we'll work by contradiction here. If it were not true that mu n converges weakly to mu, that means, by the definition of weak convergence, that there is some continuous bounded test function such that the integral of mu n against that test function g doesn't converge to the integral of g against mu. That is, there is some epsilon greater than zero and some subsequence nk prime of the original sequence of indices such that along that whole subsequence, the difference between these two is greater than or equal to epsilon in absolute value. However, this subsequence mu nk prime, being a subsequence of the original sequence, is still tight. A subfamily of a tight family is tight. And that means that we can apply Prokhorov again. There must exist some potentially further subsequence nk double prime of those indices so that mu nk double prime converges weakly to some probability measure nu. Again, that means that the Fourier transform mu nk double prime will converge pointwise to the Fourier transform of nu. But we know that mu n k double prime hat, being a subsequence of mu n hat, converges to phi, which we've already identified as mu hat. And so that shows us that mu hat equals mu hat, and we conclude by the Fourier inversion that nu is equal to mu. Therefore, mu n k double prime converges to mu weakly. But that means that with respect to any continuous bounded test function, including this one here, the difference between those two integrals goes to zero. On the other hand, by construction, that difference is always greater than or equal to epsilon. And that contradiction concludes the proof of the continuity theorem. That's the final piece of the portmanteau puzzle that we're going to use next time to begin our exploration of the second main limit theorem of probability theory, the central limit theorem.